In 1903, the world was introduced to the first recorded patent for a seven-segment type display proposed by American electrical engineer, inventor, and physicist Carl Kinsley. His invention utilized a system of seven lines which could produce every number along with every letter of the English alphabet. Kinsley proposed it improved the legibility, speed, accuracy, and cost of mechanically recorded telegraph messages. At the time, the telegraph and telephone were being widely adopted in the more developed areas of the world and were becoming more affordable with this widespread adoption by large companies and even small businesses. While the telephone offered instant communication by reproducing voices through means of electromagnetic speakers and microphones, the telegraph still remained relevant in military, railroad, and maritime operations especially considering it could be recorded onto a physical medium to be read at a later time. Kinsley's improvement to the telegraph, although sound, wouldn't be fully realized until nearly 70 years later. Long before recorded history, humans have utilized technology and methods to communicate with each other over vast distances. Anything ranging from smoke and fire signals to flag positions offered advantages in the protection of the homeland and winning battles during war. One of those in recorded history was the semaphore, which was a combination of movable armatures which were mounted to towers on hilltops. By manipulating the angles of the arms, one could convey messages to another tower in the distance, which would continue to relay the message to another, and so on. Telegraphic messages have been and will continue to play an important role in business, logistics, and even space exploration. Various machines have been conceived over the last two centuries, and only in the last hundred years do we have evidence of telegraph messages being recorded mechanically. Even today, every modern device with a display is essentially telegraphing images, characters, and digits to users through a grid pattern of organic light-emitting diodes. In Kinsley's time, most telegraphic recording systems utilized a two-wire communication protocol which required both the transmitting and receiving ends to be synchronous. The transmitting end would send the messages over miles of wire to relays which would amplify the weakened signal and retransmit them forward to the receiver often achieving a maximum of 400 words per minute. The Pollock Virag writing telegraph system was able to achieve an impressive 650 words per minute without synchronization between the transmitter and receiver. The messages on the receiving end were recorded as simple dots or dashes onto a moving tape via a pen or perforating apparatus. The movement of these being controlled by simple electromagnets. Stronger currents and shorter wires were preferred so as not to lose any messages transmitted to the receiving end. With tens of thousands of electrical pulses being sent over the lines every minute, jumps in current tended to smooth out. However, the medium used with the tape would often stick to the pen recording the messages and produce artifacts in the form of line marks that at certain speeds would make the messages completely unreadable. Kinsley's aim was to telegraph messages more accurately with fewer pulses of current at a lower cost than what was available at the time. One can sense his excitement for this new idea in his patent application and also in his subsequent writings detailing his invention. Like many inventors and scientific pioneers, he never got a chance to see the impact a seven-segment invention would have on modern society, most notably the information age. Although similar ideas utilizing segments to represent letters and words had been used throughout history, his proposal would only be experimented with here and there. People were well trained and adapted to interpreting dots and dash telegraph systems and didn't feel the need to change, especially with the growing popularity of the telephone over the telegraph. Although not much information is available about Carl, a report of his passing in 1959, along with a picture of his grave, can be found on Find a Grave's website. His headstone simply reads, Carl Kinsley, 1870-1959, Scientist. 
Electroluminescence was first reported by a Captain Henry Joseph Round, working at a British telecommunications company called Marconi Labs, named after the famous Italian radio pioneer Guglielmo Marconi. Round only briefly mentions his discovery, and it wasn't until 20 years later that Russian inventor Oleg Lusev's curiosity on the matter led him to create the first viable LED. Early versions of lit 7-segment displays included pneumatrons, which used incandescent filaments and evacuated bulbs, and minitrons, which involved more modern dual inline packaging, a widely common plug-in and program design consisting of a layout involving symmetrical opposing pins found in microcontrollers to this day. Once LED technology became cheaper and in higher demand, it started to make its way into modern devices and machinery. The 1970s and 80s produced the iconic and vibrant vacuum fluorescent displays seen in popular blockbuster movies. As time passes, VFDs become increasingly rare, leading to high asking prices from those who can find them. The 70s also produced the first liquid crystal displays for commercial use, although the discovery and application methods had been explored since the late 1800s. Early LCD prototypes were inefficient and faulty. By 1972, James Ferguson introduced the first LCD watch based on his own patent number 3,731,986. He had previously worked at Westinghouse Research Labs using liquid crystals to make temperature sensitive materials which can be found in the widely popular mood ring novelty. Ferguson had been developing a system involving liquid crystals to help screen for breast cancer when he discovered how to utilize liquid crystals in a more efficient manner than previously thought possible. Ferguson's LCD technology involving twisted pneumatic field effect made popular bond gadgets and calculators cheap and practical for businesses and working class individuals. He held over 125 LCD patents before his passing in 2008. With Ferguson's cheap and efficient LCD displays and the previous introduction of light-emitting diodes, the seven-segment method of displaying numbers and characters became widely used. Now with the introductions of cheap LED technology, anyone can produce glowing numbers and messages easily for just under a dollar a digit. For a single digit display, the method of operation is fairly simple. There tend to be 10 pins, five on each side, which protrude from underneath. For a common cathode type display, the two middle pins on opposing sides can be hooked up to ground, although only one of these is necessary. The remaining eight pins are associated with their own segment of the display. A common layout labels each segment A through G, and DP is used to reference the decimal point. By trial and error, one can use 3 volts and a resistor of 100 ohms or higher to limit the current effectively protecting the segments from being damaged. Resistors also provide a dimming effect for the display that can be adjusted to the user's liking by using higher ohm resistors. These displays are often powered and controlled by a low-cost microcontroller, similar to what can be found on the popular Raspberry Pi or Arduino boards. After hooking up one of the display's ground pins, the user can then connect each of the segment pins to any of the pins on the microcontroller. Here you can see an Atmega 328P chip taken from an Arduino Uno on a breadboard. Using the classic and still very relevant C programming language, we can code the microcontroller to display numbers and characters easily. It's merely a matter of turning on the right pins connected to the right segments. Here I have chosen port B's pins to connect to the display's pins. We only need seven pins since the decimal point is not needed here. Pin PB0 will be associated with segment A, pin PB1 with segment B, and so on. With the final wiring looking something similar to this. Referring to the diagram, in order to make a one, we need to turn on segments B and C. These we have connected to pins PB1 and PB2. In order to turn these pins on, we need to go into our code. 
Here we have our basic C code layout. At the top, we have our preamble, including the basic input, output, and delay system header files. Next, we have our main staging area. After that, we have our loop. In main, we need to set the port B pins to output electricity. Since we are going to use almost all of the available pins in port B, we can simply set them all to output using the most basic method of flipping each port B pins bit on, using ones in place of zeros. In this 8-bit representation of 0B followed by 8 zeros, we start counting port B's pins from right to left. The furthest bit on the right is associated with pin PB0. The one to the left, PB1, then PB2, and so on. Let's flip them all from off to on. We do this by going into the data direction register B, seen here, and changing the zeros to ones. The port B pins we flipped are now all set to output electricity. Another way would be to write the hex equivalent with equals operator like so. If you are familiar with Arduino or Raspberry Pi, you would write something along the lines of output. In the loop, let's start by telling the chip to display a 1 by turning on pins PB1 and PB2. We flip these two bits on. Assuming we have included an appropriate make file, which you learned about in previous videos here, and have made the appropriate changes to it, you can flash the code to the chip and see the 1 displayed properly. Going back into the code, we will add the number 2 by flipping the appropriate bits on and giving a delay in milliseconds, which has already been defined and created in the delay header file that comes with the AVRC language built in. So 1000 milliseconds is equal to 1 second if your chip is running at the factory default of 1 megahertz. However, my chip is running at the maximum 8 megahertz. To adjust for the extra 8 MHz, we just need to divide our 1000 millisecond target by 8. This gives us 125 milliseconds, which is the equivalent of 1 second for a chip running at 8 MHz. It sounds complicated, but try it and you will see each number displays for 1 second each. After this delay, we want to display a number 2. Referring to our pin diagram, we can do this by turning on pins PB0, 1, 3, 4, and 6. Let's make clean, make all, and flash the code to the chip again. What happened? We turned on the segments for our 1, delayed for 1 second, and turned on the segments for our 2, delayed for another second, and it should display a 1 again, right? The problem is, we never turned off the segments we no longer needed each time we change numbers. We need to turn off all the segments on the display after our one second delay in order to have a clean slate. We do this by allowing the already flipped on bits and flipping any remaining pins bits in port B to on with this AND equals operator. That would effectively turn them all on but we want to turn them all off. The way we do this is add the tilde in front of our 8 bits here. This tells the code to do the opposite, effectively turning them all off. Let's also add a number 3 by flipping on the pins we connected to our segments that make a 3. Don't forget to add the delay after each new number is displayed, and make sure to clear it. Great, but is there an easier way to do all this? Turning on all of these pins manually each time in the code looks confusing. And what if we wanted to call any number quickly and easily? We can do that by defining a name called a string for each number. We can also turn on each pin by shifting bits like this, instead of flipping ones and zeros. This makes it less confusing. Now we have created strings, 
or names, for turning on each number. In our code, we would just need to type the string name 0, followed by the semicolon, and include our one second delay and segment clearing code followed by one, another delay, and clearing code, two, and so on. Having fun yet? Let's take it a step further and create a function to display our number, delay for one second, and clear the display to get ready for the next number. Let's call it display number and tell it to do whatever gets put in the parentheses here. Let's call that part number, which will be a label, a word, a string of characters. Open bracket and close bracket. The function will do whatever number is. It will delay for one second and it will reset the display. Now in our loop, we only need to use our new function and put the names of each number we mapped out. What was once complicated and hard to read becomes clearer and more efficient to code for. This is the power of functions in coding, and now you have it. We send our revised code to the chip.